record. Here we go. So welcome to class. Today is lecture two. We're talking about properties of fluids. So today's lecture is kind of a mishmash of a bunch of different things about fluids. Uh, first, I want to talk about homework one. Oh my goodness, so many wonderful examples um, that you guys shared. So some of the common themes were, of course, stuff you can find in your dorm room or your home. So lots of plants, uh, drinks, and sinks, a number of hydraulic jumps um, in sinks. Um, some of my personal faves, uh, I'll be honest, like the, the, the pets, right? So puppy drinking rabbit drinking, <laughs> he made my day. Uh, I'm also a huge coffee lover, so I really like the ones about creamer mixing into coffee. Uh, there was a hilarious video with uh, somebody breaking a water balloon on his head. <laughs> if you wanna find that, it's really worth watching. And then there's one particular video I wanted to highlight. Um, really good engagement too, by the way. You know, At this point, it's over 2,000 views of the video, so. You're doing interesting stuff and, and uh, it's cool to see what you can find around the house and around your daily life that involves fluids. I want to highlight one um, particular homework assignment from Jimmy, just because it's something we're not going to see in this course, but it's pretty cool. So it's the Leidenfrost effect. So that's kind of unbelievable, right? <laughs> so it's basically if you heat um, water in a pan, you heat it just so that you get a vapor layer, a steam layer under the droplets, they can just race around the pan. So let's take just a, just a moment and learn about that because it's super cool. And like I said, we're not going to be covering it in the class. Did you know that if you get the pan hot enough, something really cool happens? First, get a pan. I like this metal shiny one I have here. Then get a stove and set it to high. Now, gas stoves and induction stoves might vary, but this one I'm using here works great. Now set the pan on the burner and wait just a few minutes. Okay, now add a little water. If the temperature's high enough, the water should just roll around the pan. It seems counterintuitive, but there's actually an explanation for this. So why does it do this? It's called the Leidenfrost effect. The pan is so hot that the water rides around on a little cushion of steam, and it can do this for quite a long time. Now we're gonna do something a little different. Let's add water until the temperature of the pan is such that the water boils. See that spot in the middle spreading out? Yep, that's the temperature in the center decreasing below the point required for the Leidenfrost effect. Go ahead, give it a try yourself. Just be careful because, hey, hot pans and hot water. If you're going to. All right, so that's a little bit about the light and frost effect. Uh, very cool. So, Jimmy, thank you for sharing uh, that particular example. And you guys feel free to do it, just do it safely. Um, I'm actually going to talk about a few more videos that you guys submitted for the homework one because uh, there were just some great videos and we're talking about a lot of things today that involve stuff you guys did on the videos. So let me start out here. Um, I'm talking about some characteristics of fluids and I am going to apologize in advance because my handwriting, my annotation today is going to be um, pretty low resolution because I'm not getting my tablet PC until Wednesday, but it'll be better on Wednesday. Um, and one other thing I want to note is that on Zoom, it's not capturing my annotation. So if you wanna take notes on this part, um, you can do that. You can wait and refer back to the video because of course, if you watch the recorded video that I post on YouTube and I post the link in the um, module, um, you'll see me filling out the slides. And you could also look at the textbook. Okay, so. Uh, will I post the annotated notes at a later time? I'll be able to do that once I have my tablet for this one particular lecture. 
I'm not able to do that because the only option I have in Zoom is saving my annotations, but then it, if I save them, it goes on every page. So this one time, um, either refer to the recording or um, take your own notes if you'd like. I did, on your request, I did post the PDFs of the slides for today. So those are on um, Canvas under the week two module for today's lecture if you are interested in seeing those. Let's use blue. So density, I think you're all familiar with this concept, right? It's a mass per unit volume. Um, let's talk a little bit as we talk about these basic concept in fluids about dimensions, right? So I'm writing here M and then times L to the minus third, right? So what does that mean? Density has units, fundamental units of mass over volume. So L is a length scale. So L cubed is a volume, right? And then the negative sign means that the L cubed is in the denominator. So fundamentally density is how much mass there is per unit volume. And it has units um, in SI units, it's got kilograms per meter cubed. Or in British gravitational units, it's slugs <laughs> per cubic feet. And you can go home and tell your friend that there's a something in engineering that has units of slugs. If you haven't heard that before. So slugs per cubic feet. And again, really sorry about the low density annotations, but this will be the only lecture like this. Okay, next we'll look at a quantity called specific weight. This is um, indicated with gamma often. So specific weight is weight per unit volume, right? So it's going to be just density times the gravitational constant G. Um, and then specific weight has fundamental dimensions of force over volume. So again, force times a length scale to the minus three power. And in SI units, that's Newton per meter squared, uh, per meter cubed. And in British gravitational system, that's pounds per cubic feet. Just a moment, just checking the chat function up here. Okay, so apparently my, <laughs> my handwriting is really bad. Um, so the question is, what is G multiplied by in the specific weight formula? And let me get rid of the chat box here. So that's rho, right? So this is gamma equals rho times G and rho is the density that we just covered that first quantity up here. Um, so that gives us units of, instead of mass per volume, it gives us units of force per volume when we multiply by G. All right, uh, and then specific gravity. Um, so specific gravity, you can think of it as a normalized density. So you take the, you've got a certain fluid and you divide its density by the density of water under standard conditions, and that's your specific gravity. It's often, um, denoted with an SG. And it's just the density of your fluid over the density of water, so I'll say H2O. Um, and it has a uh, no units and no dimensions, right? Because it's a density divided by a density, so it's got no units. But we did have a homework video, which was 
um, which illustrates the idea of specific gravity really nicely. So let's watch that. So this is Brianna's video. Example, I chose to show the different layers of liquids depending on their densities. The bottom layer is honey, which has the highest density, then dish soap, coffee, and vegetable oil, which has the lowest density. All right, so on the bottom, she's got honey, and then she's got dish soap, and then coffee, which is basically has the properties of water, right? And then vegetable oil, and you can see how they're stacked. So I have a question for you guys. Um, and my question for you is, this. Do you think the specific gravity of honey is greater than one or less than one? And the same for vegetable oil. Is the specific gravity less than one, greater than one? All right, we're over 90% voted and the votes are starting to trickle. So I'm gonna end the poll now. So this is what you guys thought. Specific gravity of honey is greater than one. Most of you thought that and specific gravity of vegetable oil is less than one. And that's correct. Um, right, so if we look at the, yikes, go away poll. Undo, undo, undo. If we look at the definition of specific gravity, it's the density of your fluid um, divided by the density of water at standard conditions. Let me just check the chat box. Uh, I had a question, is the poll graded? No, the polls are not graded. It's just to sort of gauge your level of understanding and um, hopefully help you have a little bit of fun with the, um, with the lectures. All right, my poll will not go away. So I'm just gonna stop share for just a moment and then reshare. Okay. Okay, so we looked at density, specific weight, specific gravity. Uh, let's think about density a little bit more deeply. Let's engage with this topic a little bit more deeply. So I'm gonna show you a clip now from Ant-Man, the original movie from 2015, Marvel Comics, not the 2018 movie that I have a clip for you um, on the module for this week. This is a different one. And as you watch this clip, I want you to try to notice the physics implications of what happens in the clip, right? So see if you can just notice two things that have implications for the physics. And I'm gonna leave that broad, um, but just have an eye out for the physics and what implications the video gives. Okay, here we go. So a little background for those of you who haven't seen the movie. As you can tell, I'm a huge Marvel fan. In fact, I've got my Wasp t-shirt on for today's lecture. A little background is, um, this is Paul Rudd and he's, uh, he's Ant-Man. Um, and he's putting on the Ant-Man suit for the first time. He doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know what it does. 
He's just kind of sitting in his bathroom, tinkering with it, tinkering with the electronics, and then he tries it on. Sure seems different from down here, doesn't it, Scott? Wait! Who said that? Wait, wait, wait! Who's not here? It's a trial by fire, Scott. Or in this case, water. So that's the clip, and I hope that you noticed maybe one or two um, physics things from the clip. I'm now going to place you into breakout rooms, and now it's time to pair with each other and just tell each other what you noticed about the physics of Ant-Man from that clip. And here we go. You're going to start being invited into your breakout rooms. And you have three minutes to discuss. Hey, Abigail, were you put into a breakout room? You're free to talk to me about the Ant-Man clip if you'd like. <laughs> it's okay. I got put into a breakout room and then my computer crashed, so I had to rejoin. Oh. Uh, you can talk about the Ant-Man clip if you want. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, do it. So what did you notice, sort of physics-wise, in that clip? Um, well, I noticed that there were, obviously, they were shrinking and growing um, to different scales, which I thought was interesting. And additionally, um, this kind of, I think, goes back to the, um, the post that you put uh, for this module for this week. And I was thinking about the question about the helmet as well, which I think is a really interesting concept that I had never really thought about. The idea of needing a helmet, even though they're so small, you'd think if they were so big, maybe they'd need it. But it's actually the opposite. Right. Yeah, exactly. So you notice that obviously the change in size, change in dimension, and then the, just the sort of idea about needing a helmet, so. Yeah, I thought it was, I've never, I, I, I like Marvel movies, but I haven't been able to see Ant-Man and the Wasp because I just haven't, I guess. So it never really came up and uh, I never really thought about the physics behind yes. uh, movies, but when you, 
and I didn't really know that much about ants or wasps before seeing the movie either. So when you posed the question, I was I would never even realize that um, so many animals, you know, insects are able to breathe without lungs, but they're they don't have gills either. So I think that's crazy that um, that exists in nature and things like that. It really does, and it's actually like all other higher animals, so mm -hmm. you know, complicated, bigger than you know, multicellular, complicated animals with organs. All of the other animals breathe using blood to carry the oxygen around the body. Insects are the only ones that don't. Right, exactly, and I think that's crazy. <laughs> it really is. Uh, part of it is that they're so small that they can pretty much um, breathe by. Um, diffusion alone. They mm -hmm. don't need all that convective flow, that additional forced driven flow from breathing. Right. Um, and part of it is just that the physics, the fluid dynamics is different at that scale. So they're taking advantage of different things. It's so cool. I actually do research <laughs> on Yeah, that. I remember you mentioning that, seeing your video last time was talking about looking into nature and seeing what nature's already done. But I think that's crazy. Yeah, it really is. Oh my goodness, it's 146 already, so I'm going to bring people. It's all good. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we've got 10 seconds left until all the breakout rooms close automatically. We still got a couple people over in breakout rooms. And okay, all the breakout rooms should be closed now and you should be back in the main lecture room. So, okay, can does anybody want to share some physics stuff that you noticed when you watched that clip? Hi. Hi. Uh, we said something about his weight, the effect of the gravity on his weight, because he's too small, so the gravity has not too much effect when he falls down. So he did, I think he didn't affect too much by the gravity, because if he was in the size of a human and fall from something like comparing for this uh, height, it will be much harder, you know, for his body. So that's mm -hmm. so interesting. Oh, yeah. So you're saying his body is stronger. Not stronger. His weight is less. Therefore, the gravity. His mass is less. Therefore, the gravity effect on his mass is not too much. So does not affect his body when he fall down. You know, when the, the when you the ant is fall from a distance, it's not like uh, comparing to his size. It's not like a human falling comparing right. to his size. That's so that's a good observation. But I wonder, and the reason I wonder is because when he falls out of the bathtub. He cracks a tile on the floor. And so I imagine if an ant fell out of the bathtub from that mm -hmm. height, a couple feet and fell onto the floor, it wouldn't come close. Come, yeah. Right? So, yeah. But I think that's a really key observation. And the other things we already noticed that uh, she noticed more than be that the tension because he's so small, the tension, uh, he cannot break the, the tension of the water surface. So the water can't push him up because okay. he has a small size. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, I just got a question. Um, somebody's a Marvel fan. They said enter PIM particles. Um, so somebody just asked a question, are the polls graded? The polls are not graded. So it's just for discussion purposes. Uh, did anyone else want to share another observation about the physics of the clip we watched with Ant-Man putting on a suit?
we were talking and we were thinking that he was actually the same weight when he shrank, but because he was so much smaller mm -hmm. in point, like the force was like so pinpointed, that's why I broke the tile. Okay, okay, that's a great observation. Um, anything else anyone wanted to share? Well, I'd say something that um, if you assume that he's the same weight, but he's just really small, then he should be incredibly dense and he shouldn't be able to float on, side the, on top of the water. Right. <laughs> That's a really good observation, right? Because if he's the same mass, right, but a different volume, then he's got a really high density, right? Density is mass per, per unit volume. Um, so that's a really good point. And uh, there's a little bit of rivalry between Marvel Comics fans and DC Comics fans. And the Marvel Comics fans like to say that DC doesn't get their physics right. But the truth is Marvel doesn't always get the physics right either, right? Because that's what you just said is a little bit of a contradiction. Another contradiction you see when this question arises about Ant-Man, is his mass the same as when he's human or does it scale down? Another contradiction that arises is just now in this clip we saw, he is flushed out of the bathtub and he falls on a tile and breaks it. So that implies he's got large mass, right? But then there's another scene where he runs along the barrel of a gun, right? And so obviously if he had the weight of a human, that would disturb the person holding the gun, but it doesn't. So they're not even consistent. So it's a good, good catch to catch that inconsistency. Anyone else want to share? Um, I, th I thought it was interesting how he kind of got ejected from the water. Like yeah. If you think about throwing like a beach ball or something in the water, even if there's like big waves, I don't think it would get like rejected out of the water or ejected, I guess. Yeah, right. The implication there is that the, that the splash was so forceful that it ejected him out. Yeah, who knows how realistic that is for sure. Certainly doesn't happen when I fill up my bathtub, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm actually gonna give you guys another poll. Not graded, this is just for, um, this is just for us. And so the poll is asking you, do you think that Ant-Man's mass scales down from watching that clip? All right, we're over 95% voted and they're starting to trickle in. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So slight majority, most of a little more than half of you said you don't think that his mass scales down when he shrinks. About 30% say yes and 17% say not sure. So, I mean, the answer is if you're just going by this clip, then the mass doesn't scale down, right? So the 52% who said no are correct. If you're thinking about the whole Marvel Universe and the, how they present his mass, you know, if you watch a clip where he's running on the barrel of a gun or where the wasp, for example, she's uh, his, his partner, um, where she runs along the blade of a knife without making the knife deviate from its path, right? If you look at clips like that, then you think, okay, yes, it does scale down. But the truth is, Marvel is not consistent about this. But if we go with the assumption that we made watching this clip, this particular clip, then no, the mass does not scale down. All right. So <laughs> now um, I want you to try and think about a little bit more. We're gonna go back into breakout rooms, this time probably with different people because I'm gonna assign it um, randomly again and think about the results of the first poll and the question of whether Ant-Man's mass scales down and try to think about why you think that Ant-Man and the Wasp, his partner who didn't show up in this clip, why they need helmets to breathe when they shrink down. Okay, so I'm going to, well, let me check the chats before I do this. 
<laughs> I agree, Marvel should hire a few engineers. Oh, we have a really good question about Marvel physics and PIM particles. Um, yes, there are theories, and it, I believe is explicitly stated in one of the movies that the mass and matter is still there, but it gets shunted into other dimensions. So quantum mechanics and other dimensions are beyond the scope of this course. So we'll just talk about density and fluid mechanics. All right. Going to start our breakout room, same deal as last time. Um, just go back and discuss why you think Ant-Man and the Wasp need helmets when they shrink down to insect size, and we'll come back in three minutes. Hey, Ryan. Did you want to talk out uh, why Ant-Man and the Mask might need, Ant-Man and the Wasp might need masks with me? I don't know if you can hear me or not, so I'm going to join breakout room eight, which was your room last time. Hey, Corbin, I'm just dropping in on you. I don't know if you can see me. Yeah, I don't have really anybody else in here. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I came by. The, uh, the person I had uh, put you in a breakout room with is um, apparently not, um, maybe had to take a small break or something. So okay. tell me, what, what's your thoughts on why Ant-Man and the Wasp need helmets when they shrink down to the micro scale? So I actually remember you visiting um, I was in the web um, professional development seminar last year. Okay, so you know the answer if you remember. Yeah, well, I actually already posted on the discussion board as well about it and drew a little picture on it, what I like, what I remember. Yeah. Um, but basically, like when he's smaller, um, I think it was the like I, I kind of said like air molecules like are definitely like bigger into his perspective, so there's right. like more space that he's like not able to get as much oxygen as he would need. And yeah, yeah. The same where he's bigger, the particles are smaller, so they're easier for him to, you know, for him to inhale, so he would get intentionally too much oxygen. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I mean, that's, that's sort of what my student and I came up with, and we really thought about more in terms of density, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think of the scale of Ant-Man's lung, right, and then how many oxygen molecules get inhaled on one inhalation and then you mm. think the air the atmosphere is the same but now ant-man's this big how many oxygen molecules get inhaled on one inhalation right so mm -hmm. I think that that's a big limitation but uh oh it looks like ryan is here now hi ryan hey sorry about that no problem uh i was keeping corbin company in here and he gave me some very well-formed thoughts about why i'm in and the wasp need helmets to breathe i'm gonna hop out and close the breakout rooms so thanks guys thank you Hey, welcome back. Just waiting here while everybody comes from the uh, breakout rooms to the, the main lecture room here.
Let me see. I think we've got just about everyone back in the main lecture room. Um, yes, everyone's back. Okay, welcome back. So, um, we had a few minutes to discuss why we think Ant-Man and the Wasp need helmets to breathe. Does anyone want to share what you came up with in your discussion? Um, one thing that we were talking about is perhaps like if we go off the assumption that he maintains like, you know, his same uh, mass as he shrinks. Yeah. Um, then perhaps he would need like a suit to help like physically support him because, you know, being such a high mass at like at such a small like concentrated point, yeah. um, it might, he might like physically just collapse if he didn't have any kind of like pressure stabilization, like, you know, gear to put on yeah. to help him like maintain allows lungs to breathe and yeah is so that was yeah. our guess yeah, that's it that's really gets the essence of things so thank you for sharing that anyone else want to share we're going to take a poll about it and see what everyone thought but does anyone else want to share something maybe that was pretty different from that it may require the same amount of oxygen as before so by shrinking the oxygen down with him it would make it proportional right yeah so if we're assuming that it's the same amount of mass that needs to be nourished with oxygen, nutrients, et cetera. Right. Any other thoughts? This is not related to the breathing, but we noticed something interesting, which is there anything special about the visor? Is the way his, his eyes interact with light different at that scale? Is something we were wondering about? Probably. I haven't looked at that into that myself, but in just two slides, <laughs> I'm going to give you guys a bunch of references for where you can go if you're interested in reading more about the physics of Ant-Man and the Wasp. And there is actually an article that discusses that. They say his voice would sound ridiculous at that scale and you know all sorts of other things. All right, so let me, um, let me go ahead and start our next poll. And the poll is just asking you, well, what do you think? What do you think are the reasons that Ant-Man and the Wasp need helmets to breathe when they shrink to insect size. For this poll, you can answer more than one. So if you think it's two reasons, three reasons, go ahead and select them all. Here we go. All right, we're at 94% voted again. It's starting to slow down. I'm going to end the poll and show you guys the results. 98%. Okay. <laughs> so the number one reason people thought was that they can't take in enough oxygen when they're that small. Um, and I like that answer. The next most popular reason was to shrink the oxygen molecules down so that their cells can use them for cellular respiration. I like that answer too. Um, third most popular to filter out um, any dust or other particles. Yeah, probably, right? Um, and then the other option was to protect their heads because of reduced structural integrity at that size. This isn't a solid mechanics course, but um, generally the smaller something is, the more structural integrity it has. So that was a little bit of a... Um, red, not really a red herring, but you know, that question was in there just so they aren't, weren't all um, definite yeses. So I don't think that that's the case. I think that Ant-Man and the Wasp would actually have more structural integrity um, because forces that are proportional um, to surface and volume change in importance when you're at that scale. So surface proportional forces become really important like surface tension, pressure, volume proportional forces like gravity 
become much less important, relatively speaking. So things are actually a little bit stronger when they're small. All right. Oh, my goodness, people, we have 10 minutes left. <laughs> Let me. Um, so I have a question in the chat box. It's saying, can we still answer the extra credit or not? And so that's the extra credit from module two. Yes, absolutely. You can absolutely answer that still. So basically, the modules kind of expire at midnight on their week, midnight Sunday on their week. All right. So we just did a deep dive into the concept of density. And it turns out that, let me skip ahead a little bit, my student and I wrote a paper <laughs> that was published in the Journal of Superhero Science and Technology, which is a real scientific journal. And it answered exactly this question, why Ant-Man and the Wasp need helmets to breathe. And the analogy that we came up with to show that they need it because they need more oxygen was that if you take in a lung full of air and Paul Rudd is his size, you know, 1.8 meters, you take in a lung full of air, you have a large volume full of many of N oxygen molecules, right? And when he shrinks down to the size of an insect, he still needs the same amount of oxygen, but when he takes in a lung full of air, it's much smaller. Right. And so you need a mask or something to support respiration out of the many reasons that we talked about and came up with. And in fact, we showed in our paper that the relative density that he would experience the size of an ant is similar to what we would experience in the far outer reaches of our atmosphere in the thermosphere. Right. So that's like where the international a well, little bit below where the International Space Station is. So um, so deep dive into the concept of density. Um, if you want to know more about the physics of Ant-Man and the Wasp, I've got a bunch of resources here for you. A lot of them are really fun. We're going to get, I have a bunch more slides for today uh, and not that much time. I don't want to rush anything. So we're just going to start and we'll see where we end up and we'll pick up where we left off next time. So we looked at specific gravity, density, um, Let's turn to the concept of viscosity now. So I have another Flipgrid homework one video that I want to play that illustrates this so nicely. Um, from Ray. Hi, I'm Ray. And this is me pouring honey. And then me pouring juice. And that's the two different viscosities. How honey has more viscosity than the juice. Right. Hi, I'm Ray. So that was a perfect illustration of what viscosity is. It resists a shearing force, right? So what's a shearing force? Again, if you have a block of some substance, a solid anything, and it's a cube shape, and you have forces that are normal to the surfaces of the cube, those are normal forces. If you have ones that are smearing, across the, the surface, that's a shearing force, right? The definition of a fluid is a substance that cannot resist even the smallest shearing force. It must deform under even the smallest shearing force. But some fluids resist shearing forces better. When you saw Ray pouring the honey, it sort of took a while to get going and to come out of the bottle, right, with the juice, which basically has the properties of water, came out right away. Um, so let's take a little bit of a dive into viscosity. This is probably all we'll have time for today before we need to wrap up, right? So here in this picture. Dr. Staples, we can't see your screen. Oh, no. You haven't shared it. Sorry. We, like, it was in the chat, but we didn't get to see the video as well. I'm so sorry. I must be sharing just, can you see the PowerPoint right now? No, at least I can't. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Can you see it now? No? Okay. No. Yep, I can see I've got five chats piled up. So sorry about that. From one minute ago, that's not too bad. So was the only thing you missed the video from Ray? Yes. Okay, great. So let me play that again. And thank you for letting me know. Okay, yeah, we can see the screen now. Great. Sorry about that. All right, here we go again. <laughs> This is me pouring honey. 
and then eight point juice, and that's the two different viscosities. How honey has more viscosity than the juice. Great. So that's a great example, and you all have experience with that from everyday life. Try to pour honey; it really takes a lot for it to um, overcome the force of gravity, uh, the resistance to the force of gravity, and start flowing. So. On the previous slide here, we've got this picture. And what we're looking at is imagine you're taking a slice through two plates. And between the two plates, there's a fluid. The plates are solid. The bottom plate is fixed. The top plate is being dragged along with a constant force P so that it's moving to the right with a constant velocity, capital U. So we're looking into this channel now. We've taken a slice. The height of the channel is little b, y, is the variable from the floor to the ceiling that parameterizes that. Um, we've got a vertical line here, a dashed vertical line, and then after a time, delta t, that vertical line becomes um, a line that's placed at an angle, right? So at time zero, we've got the vertical line AB if we were to draw a line in the fluid, and then at time delta t, that line gets rotated and sheared. This represents these arrows, this sort of triangle with the arrows in, in the middle represent the velocity profile. So in this particular channel, there's a linear velocity profile. So at the very top of the channel, the fluid in the channel, and so that's the, the fluid's velocity profile. The fluid in the channel is moving with the same velocity as the plate at capital U. And at the very bottom of the channel by something called the no slip condition, um, which means that if you've got a surface at rest and you've got a fluid flowing past it, right at the surface, the fluid is at rest too. It's called the no slip condition. And for practically every application in this class, we'll make the assumption that we have the no slip condition in place. It also means that if the surface, that if a fluid's flowing and it's in contact with the surface that's moving, the fluid in contact with that surface has the same velocity as that surface, which is moving. All right, so we've got a linear velocity profile. It goes from zero at the bottom plate to capital U at the top plate. We're drawing an imaginary vertical line in the fluid. We're letting the plate go for a small time delta T, and we see that vertical line get sheared out, become a little longer, and rotate through an angle. The angle it rotates through is delta beta, and the line is now goes from A to B prime. And the horizontal distance traveled between B and B prime, we're gonna call delta A. All right, so let's workshop this a little bit. So we've got our no slip condition Um, here at the bottom, Whoops. can't see the cursor on the screen, so it's hard to know where it's landing. Here we go. <laughs> We've got our no slip condition here. And we can imagine, just going to stop the share for one second to see if I can get my cursor back. Sorry about that. There's a package outside for you. That's very exciting. It's a big one. That's very exciting. Okay, let's, let's try this again. So now imagine we take a little, <laughs> how about you need to go? And you need to go downstairs, please, with dad. Let's try this annotate again. We'll give it one more chance. Okay, now I've got my cursor. Yay. All right, imagine we take a little square fluid particle that's inside the fluid and it's being sheared. 
and we'll expand this square fluid particle over here. And I just realized that it's 215 just as I'm getting into this example. So I'm going to pause here and we'll pick up next time. I have just two reminders for you before you leave the meeting. Uh, and the reminder is that on Wednesday, we're going to be starting some topics in chapter two. So please read the textbook readings that are in the module from chapter two. Um, you can feel free to go now. I'll stay on in case anyone has any questions and we'll pick up this example on Wednesday. Um, how do I recommend doing your weekly reading? Um, yes, book first and then come to lecture, right? So my lectures are not comprehensive. Um, they're more to sort of get you to engage deeply on certain topics. So please read the textbook sections that appear in the module first. All right, thank you everyone. Sorry for the snafus today. I'm gonna have a proper tablet PC on Wednesday and so um, the annotation should look a little bit nicer.